All right, peace, 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 peace. Uh, welcome to the live stream. I know I haven't went live in a little bit. I actually just woke up, but I've been, I uh, said, man, I got to get up and go live. So I wanted to say what's up to everybody here and, and just go live. What's up, John? I see you. I see you there, man. Make sure you, make sure you hit that like button when you're there. Um, today, we're going to talk about the three reasons God hates sin. The couple things that I've been discussing with people lately, and I want to elaborate on them. I want to present them to you and, um, and just offer this teaching. So if, if you have any questions, put them in the side. As I get done, as I'm going through, I will get to you and answer your questions. Uh, we're going to start with some scripture. We're going to talk about the few reasons that God hates sin today. We're going to start with some scripture, all right? First, we're going to start with Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 through 19. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, um, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord amongst brothers. Right. Um, so the first one can really pretty much be connected to pride. This is there are six things the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Pride is, would be the first one. God hates pride. God hates pride, um, and it's the most dangerous. And you know what I was I was realizing, um, you know, pride is people people get lured into deception with pride. Like pride is a temptation. Like there's a temptation to be proud. One of the one one a very strong temptation is proud. If you think about the women's movement, right? The women's movement they're seduced in with pride. It's you can be just like a man, right? Eat Adam and Eve, the story is of Adam and Eve, right? Eve was seduced with pride. Don't you know if you eat this fruit, you'll be just like God? Like she was seduced, she was lured in so that she can be proud, right? She was lured into the sin of pride. It's, it's a huge temptation. We think about temptation to sexual sin or temptation to commit some kind of fraud or theft, but no, there's a huge temptation to be proud. Right. The women's movement. Oh, you can be you don't have to stay at home like a woman. You should go out into the world and be just like a man is. They're being tempted to be proud, to being to elevating their pride above their husbands, to elevating, elevating their pride above their children and what's best for their families. Right. Because that's what the pride is going to do. God hates pride. Right. But the Bible says sin separates us from God. So pride is a sin is going to separate you from God. But pride will also separate you from your family. Right. If, if, if there is a family and the husband gets proud and says, you know what, I, I can get a, a, a he have, he can have a beautiful wife. I can get any woman I want. Right. I don't you know, I can get I can I can go outside and get a new woman tomorrow. If I just went out in the streets and approached enough women, I'll get a new wife just as good as this tomorrow. What is it going to do? It's going to separate you from your wife and break the covenant that you have in place because you're puffing yourself up. If the woman gets proud, I don't got to stay home and be no woman. I can go out there and work just like a man's going to work. I don't got to be like this. I can go and be what a man's going to be. What's that going to do? It's going to puff her up and separate her from her husband. And, and when our pride puffs us up, it separates us from God, right? It separates us from God. So that's pride separates. People are tempted right now to being a Hebrew Israelite. To, they're, oh, you're, you're the chosen people. <laughs> you don't have to. You, God is going to invoke judgment on these other people, right? They're lured in this temptation of pride, pride and being puffed up, Right? It's in, in, and whether it is or it isn't, the fact of the matter is what the lure is, what the draw is, is for young men who don't have much going on, you know what I mean? Or, or, or don't have a hope or don't have a purpose or don't have a destiny or don't know where they're going in their life to have some sense of pride about themselves, where they come from and their heritage, right? If it is, let it be what it is. But when we begin to use this to be proud, we're in danger, we're in evil, and we're separating ourselves from, from God. All right, so Proverbs 6, verse 16 says, there are six things the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him, haughty eyes, which is pride, a lying tongue, lying, right? Hands that shed innocent blood, right? There's a, there's a case right now about Roe Ro versus Wade, about the shedding of innocent blood, right? The, 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 these children being birthed in these, these people's wombs, these are innocent, this is innocent blood. When women go get these procedures so that they don't have to carry babies to term, that's the shedding of innocent blood, Right? A heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are haste to run to evil. If you see a fight down the block, right, and you're the first person to run to the fight, you hear some commotion in the background. You you heard you heard a, and you're the first one to run to the commotion. Right. One thing my father told me growing up, he said, "Man, if you see a fight, and I always appreciated this, and, and I kept this, 
um, for the most part, <laughs> I always remember this, even though, even when I was going against that knowledge, it was always like sitting in me. And my father always told me, when you see a fight, turn the other way. Um, if you see a fight, turn the other way, because you make yourself a part of that energy and you're going to draw those experiences to yourself as well. When you, when you haste to run and go watch a fight and be entertained by this, then you bring that energy into your life. So if you see something like that going on, just turn and walk the other way. That's one thing my father always taught me growing up. And I, I, for the most part, I always kept that. He also taught me in that same field, never to carry a knife. Never carry a weapon. Make, make sure you guys hit the like button when you get in. Never carry a knife and never carry a weapon. Because when you carry a knife and carry a weapon, an opportunity is going to be presented to you for you to have to use it. Now, whether or not you use it or not, it's going to be a completely different story. But the opportunity for you to have to use it or to be tempted to use it will be made manifest in your life. So when you have that gun, when, you, when you're walking around with a knife, now you may, you may um, and I don't want to say cower out, but I'll, I'll use that just for, the, the term, the, 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 for understanding. You may cower out in a situation, you may be confronted with a situation where, all right, now here's your opportunity to use this knife. This person is here. They're doing this. They're doing that. Now you may cower out and never use it, but you're going to draw experiences to yourself to be tempted to have to use it, right? So it says, feet, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord amongst brothers. When you see people, people do this with me. Um, when you see somebody do this, oh, hey, did you see what this person said about you? You know, just running to, 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 to create discord, right? I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm here. To, I, my, my purpose is to, do the, to, is to do the will of God through Christ Jesus, my Lord. If anybody, you know what I mean? That's it. That's it. Um, that's it. That's what my focus and my aim and my heart is set on to do. That's it. Whatever somebody's saying, let people gonna talk. Let them, let them, let people do what they do. But my heart is to do the will of God, you know. Um, right. So anyway, let's let's continue. Um, Psalms five verse four through five says, "You are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evil doers. You have people that say God hates the sinner, but does, God hates the sin, but doesn't hate the sinner. Uh, you got to show me that scripture." Right. The, the Bible says in Psalm 5, 5, verses four through five, says you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evil doers. Right. I don't know when you show me that he hates the sin, but but not the sinner verse. Now, God loves as well. And I'm going to talk about that. Um, but you got to show me that verse. People say that a lot, but I, don't, I haven't I haven't seen that yet. Maybe somebody else can, um, you know, I haven't, I just say, I haven't seen that yet. Um, and yeah, John, you should definitely stop carrying that pocket knife. I'm seeing you from the corner because I'm reading my list, but I'm seeing it, the little thing you said. Yeah, you, you're going to keep drawing negativity to yourself. Now, you, you may never use it because you may not have, you know, whatever. It doesn't matter. You may have too much love to use it. Let's just put it that way. Um, but you carrying it draws to yourself and repent for carrying it as well. Don't just, don't just stop carrying it, John. Repent from carrying it because you're not putting your trust in God, right? That pack and knife can't save you, right? The Bible says this. I'm, I'm going to paraphrase this, but it, it, there, there's a verse that says, um, if you hire people to watch the gates of the city, but, but you don't know the God, then they watch the city in vain because they fall asleep. If you build a house, but you don't know God, then you build the house in vain because a gust of wind can happen. A storm can come. It can knock the entire thing down. Um, if you carry a knife, you carry a knife in vain because five people can come with bigger knives. Like we do these things in vain and we're not putting our trust in God. We're putting our trust in our own ability to defend ourselves. Right. We're not putting in our trust in God. You know, there's no requirement for you to carry a knife, you know, but you put your trust in God for security. So some of the things that might be happening to you, John, some of the things that may be, you know, somebody bumping into you or whatever it might be is because you're, you're carrying out, you're putting out temptation for you to use what you're carrying around. Don't carry any weapons, put your trust in God and repent, say God of repent in the name of Jesus Christ for not putting your faith in God, but putting in your faith in your own ability to feel secure in some, in some object from, from the making of man's hands instead of, instead of the protection of the hand of God, All right? Can't, if, if can't, not, this is the thing, Bible says not a sparrow falls out of the sky outside of God's awareness. So can't nothing happen to you that God doesn't, that, that he sees it all, right? He sees it all. And, but you got to put your faith in him. And you got to take the faith out of yourself. 
you know, do the minimal. I don't want to say do the minimal. Do your part. Lock your doors at night. Do your part. You know what I mean? Um, but don't if you forget to lock them, don't be afraid. But do your part. Uh, do 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 the standard. Lock your doors at night, whatever. Do the standard. Um, but don't don't you don't in the extra. Put it in God's hand. Guys, I'm gonna do my part. Um, but I'm gonna put the extra in your hands. Anything else is in your because you a knife can't save you, man. A, a triple master lock can't protect your house. I was watching some guy on YouTube shorts that he's like the master lock pick. And he was showing how like met the master locks and all these strong locks, how easy they are to just pick. But people think, oh, I got this big old master lock. I'm gonna get the $300 master lock because the $300 master lock is going, you know I mean? Is that's going, that's for double protection in case somebody tries to steal it. Now you're in dangerous territory. When you're playing out, you, of course, get a standard little lock. But when you start trying to say, I'm gonna spend three times as much for triple protection, now you're in violation because now you're putting double trust in man. If you can do your part, get a little lock, put a lock on your bike, cool, right? But when you take it excessively, when you're like, now nah, I got to get the triple one because somebody might try to get it. Now, now you, 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 you're crossing the line. There's a line. <clears throat> do your part and then put your faith in God. Um, so, uh, so Psalm 5 verse 4 through, through 5 says, you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers, right? Um, we got another verse here. It says, surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor is his ear too dull for hear. This is out of Isaiah. Um, and this is important when it comes to prayer, right? This is very important when it comes to prayer. Because a lot of people, when people say, why does these things happen to these people? Uh, why does these things happen to these people? Why innocent people this? Why, why, if God, if there's a God this, if there's a God that, um, if there's a, why, why are these things happening to these people? Right, a lot of people say that, but I'm, I'm, I'm gonna tell. I'm gonna give you a verse. This is Isaiah 59. It says, "Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ears too dull to hear. So his arm is not too short to save. He can save you, and he can hear you. Surely he can hear you. Surely he can save you. But your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden His face from you, so that He will not hear. Right." So why do these things happen to innocent people? This person, isn't it? Well, nobody's innocent, let's be clear. But why do these things happen to these people, right? Um, I mean, nobody's free of sin, I'll say, right? Um, people can be innocent of the crime they're being, commit they're being accused of. Um, so it goes, surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from God, right? Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Right. So our, our sins and our iniquities separate us from God and they hide his face from us so he won't hear. Right. And, and just to add on to that, with, with, with one final addition to that, Psalms verse 28, and then we're going to get into the actual topic. Um, so Proverbs 28, 9 says, he that turneth away his ear from hearing the instructions, the law of God, even his prayer shall be an abomination. Right, that those who turn to sin, that even their prayer shall be an abomination. Those who live in perpetual sin, that their prayer shall be an, uh, an abomination. Now we have an advocate, right? That's is why Jesus came. We have an advocate. We have an advocate. And we're going to talk about that too. We have an advocate now. This is these are Old Testament. But this is still the structure. The Bible, God doesn't change. However, we have an advocate now. There's a mediator. A price has been paid for these offenses that we can accept in Christ Jesus. But this is the nature of what we're dealing with, though it's still important to understand the nature of what we're dealing with, right? Um, and even the Bible says that, um, you know, if you continue to sin after receiving the way of truth in Christ, it no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. So, you know, but, but, but we do have an advocate to wash away and be cleansed of the sins of old. Um, you know, we have, we have an advocate, right? All right, now let's get into the three reasons that God hates sin. This is the main thing I wanted to talk about. I, I spent a, a lot of time... <laughs> More time than I wanted to on that. <clears throat> but um, so the first reason is going to be um, the world is his and everything in it, right? The world is God's and everything in it. There's a scripture in, in, in Psalms 24, verse 1, that says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Who Whatever is under the whole, no, the, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The whole world and those who dwell in it are God's, right? Job 41 says, Who has given to me that I should repay him? Whatever is under the whole heaven is mine, right? So one, this is what we have to understand. Um, 
and I give people this analogy, right? If, you, if let's just say you, ha you have your ATM card and you leave your ATM card on the table and you got a million dollars in the bank and I'm, I'm, I'm over at your house hanging out and I, you go out or you go to sleep and I, I take your ATM M M card somewhere and I swipe it and, and buy a car with your, with, your, with your bank card. Whose car is it? Is it my car? Even if I got the car put, put in my name, I could have went and did the paperwork, got the car, put in my name, but use your bank card to do it. Whose car is it? Is it my car just because it's in my name or is it your car? I'm sure you would make the case that it's your car. Well, it's your car, it is your car, but it's under my name, but it's your car. But you can, because it's your car, you can go and, and, fig and figure this whole thing out. You can take that car out of my name, put it back in your name, take it from me, rightfully so, because I use your money to do it. So the really reality is the entire earth is God's. The phone that you have, that's not your phone, that's God's phone. It's what, your name is on it, but everything in that phone, God made it, right? It, it was, it, you know, it's his bank card made it in the analogy, right? His bank card bought it. Everything in that car he bought, the hands that you have right here, these hands, they're God's hands, they're not yours. They're in your name, but where they come from, God made it. The chair that I'm sitting on, the window behind me, the laptop that I'm speaking on, the camera that I'm using, whose is it? It's God's, right? So the Bible says, this is why Job says, hey, who has given me anything that I should repay him? So when Job lost a lot of his stuff, God said, do I owe you something? Everything is mine. So whether you, whether your wife, whatever is not there anymore, it's all mine. That's mine. You're mine, right? Everything in the world belongs to me. I made all of this. It don't become yours just because your name is on it. My, it's my money that bought this stuff. All my money bought this. It ain't yours. It's mine. Now you're using it as in your name. These things are in your possession, but they're all ultimately mine. So one of the things that happens is we take what's God's and use it for sin, right? We take these hands that God gave us and use God's hands that he made to commit evil with, right? It ain't just mine. This ain't my body, my choice. Right? We take what's God's and use it for evil. We take the mind, the imagination that God created, right? And we use our imagination and mind to devise evilness and wickedness. Is how are you going to use that which I made? How are you going to use what belongs to me to devise wickedness and evil, right? We use our, hand, our eyes that God made these eyes. They're his eyes. They're in our name right now. We're using them, right? But they're his eyes that he made. So how can you make take my eyes and make them a part of pornography and wickedness? How, how dare you? How do you take what's mine and use it for evil? Right? It's all God's. Nothing belongs to you. It, it's, in, it's just in your name. Right? It's, or it can be given to you, but it's God. So if he wants to take it, he can take it because it's his. It's his to give and it's his to take. Right? It's his to allow you to have, and it's his to take back from you. It's all God's. So how do you take God's car? That car you're driving ain't yours. A man used everything of God's and just and just and re, and reshaped it. Right? But he used God's imagination. He used God's hands to reshape it. He used God's imagination to devise a design. He used God's imagination to devise a plan. And use God's hands, God's back, God's legs to put together a car, God's metal, God's, God's leather, you know, God's cloth and, and, and God's bronze and God's copper, right? To, to make pipes and formulate a car. He took everything that belongs to God and used it to shape it and form it to make a car. So when that car is made, that ain't your car, that's God's car. The same way if I take it, like I said, if I take your debit card and go to the mall and buy a bunch of clothes and you don't know, right? And I come back with the clothes, you're gonna say, that's my clothes, right? And you're gonna go get your money back because it's you, it's you, if you want, then you can say, all right, you, you took my, you used it, I'll let you have it. But that's still mine, right? And But the better analogy is the car or the house. I take your a million dollars at your bank account to buy a house. Right, you that's your house, even if I got it in my name, because I use all your money to buy it. So the point is, the very house that you're living in, the very apartment that you're in, what the chair that you're sitting on, that is all God's. This is one of the reasons we have to give thanks, one of many, but it's all God's. This window behind me, that's God's. The chair I'm sitting on, that's God's. Everything belongs to Him because everything we have is made with that which is His.
So you, you should be giving thanks for all that you have because without him, none of this would be. And how dare you take what's his and use it for sin? How dare you take a knife that that knife is his, the metal on the knife, the, 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 the motor around the handle, whatever it is, God made all these things. So how can you take what's mine, make a knife and commit murder and shed innocent blood with that which is mine? You don't take my stuff and join it to evil. You can't do that. And that's, that's why it's so, it's so dangerous and evil, right? You cannot take what's God's and use it for evil. That's reason number one. Is everything is God's, and you cannot take what's God's and use it for evil, right? It, that is, it's, dis, it's completely disrespectful. If I come to your house right now and, and you go on vacation and you let me stay at your house and I throw a house party in your house and trash the whole house, you you gonna you're not gonna say, oh well, but you yeah, but you left me the house for the weekend. You let me borrow your house for the weekend. Why I can't throw a party and, and, and trash your house? Oh, because it's my house, and you don't take my house and use it for evil. Right. You don't take my house and use it for evil. So number two is tied to this. So I'm going to get into number two because it's connected to this. But it's an analogy I thought of <clears throat> that's a bit more fitting that, I, that some people can probably understand. Um, so let's just say. Right. And, I, you know, I, I know about stories like this. Um, let's just say somebody has you have a bed. right? You have a house. Let's say you have a son or a daughter. Right. You have you married. So you have a house. You're married. You have a wife and you have a son. And you have a daughter and a wife and you have a bed. Right. Let's say you come home one day. Hypothetically. Right. You come home from work and you see your daughter in your bed. Um, women more can identify with this because they're a little more like clean when it comes. They understand this like subtlety a little more. Um, but you take your bed like you go home and you go into your bedroom and your daughter's in your bed sleeping with a guy committing sin and laying in your bed with a guy, right? Now, what would you probably want to do with the bed, right? Most people would throw the bed away because now the bed has become detestable. The bed has become disgusting because another man and woman has used my bed and defiled it by sleeping in my bed, not only committing sin, but committing sin in my bed. Most people will probably want to throw the bed away. Right? A lot, some people would even want to burn the bed, right? Some people would either want to burn the bed. They said, man, we throwing this bed away. My daughter use my, is sleeping with a guy in my bed. I, I can't, you're going to get right back in the bed and sleep with it right behind you. You're going to say, get out of my bed with that man. Throw the man out your house, then get right back in the bed and cozily lay to sleep. No, you, most people wouldn't do it. I know a lot, there's a lot of wickedness going on now, so I don't know, but, <clears throat> but, you, but most people ain't going to, if they come home, and it, let's just say it's a stranger, so I won't even forget you if it's your daughter. They come home, and it's two strangers sleeping together in their bed, and they and they get upset. They they run the strangers out, and they throw the strangers out of the house. What are you doing in my house? And they run them out. You, they, are they going to come back in the house and get right back into the bed and lay down and go to sleep? No, your bed has been defiled because the sin that was committed in your bed has now separated you from your bed. Right now, the it's, the sin has separated you from your bed. You can't just get right back in the bed anymore and just go to sleep. You don't get back. You don't get back in the bed and go to sleep. You need. You're gonna get a new bed. You man, I'm gonna throw this bed away. I can't. I don't feel comfortable getting in this bed that these two strangers were just, uh, you know, fornicating in in my bed and getting right back in that bed and going to sleep. I don't feel comfortable with that. So more than likely, you're gonna throw the bed out. You may even want to burn it, right? Because the sin that was committed in the bed and with your bed separated you from wanting to be in your bed, wanting to fellowship with your bed, wanting to lay in your bed. So our sin is detestable to God and it separates us from him. And like I said, the same way you'd probably, what you what would you want to do with the bed if, if two strangers slept in your bed and you didn't know about it and you came home and found it, you probably want to burn the bed. You either want to throw it out, get a new bed or burn it. And God has flooded the earth before because of wickedness and sin of the world. But you'd probably want to burn the bed as well. And you know, um, so but the last thing you would do is if there was a way, let's just say, to take your child and sacrifice them for your bed to be made clean again, you probably wouldn't do that. You said, I could just get a new bed. I, that's, it's not, I can, I can, I can, I can, God can just make a new world, He can make a new earth. He can, he can, he, he's flooded the earth before. He can, he can make a new earth, right? 
But most of us wouldn't make a sacrifice to make that bed clean again. We just throw it away and get a new bed. And yeah, it's a bed and it's not a human being, but we're not gods. That's the analogy I always say. We're not God. God is not a man, you know? So we're closer to, I, got, I give the analogy about the, about the cow. We're closer to the cow than we are to God, right? As, as God is as high as the heavens is from us, and his ways above our ways. And, and I know we're in the image of God, but I'm just saying just as far as like, all right, the cow can think, we can think. The cow can eat, we can eat. But God can create worlds and, 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 and infinitely more and all powerful, and we can't do those things. So the point is that um, our sin defiles us, and God does not do sin, right? And sin separates. It, it, it's detestable. It's disgusting. It's abominable, right? And so there is no, it, the, the sin separates us. It puts a barrier between us, him, from us being able to fellowship with God, right? Because our sin has made us detestable and wicked and evil. The same way if, a, if strangers had, has, well, I won't say the same way, but comparable to if strangers has, has, has slept in your bed and you didn't know them and they were committing fornication and all kind of other wickedness, you want to throw the bed away because it would put a barrier and separation between you and your own bed. You can never enjoy the bed the same way again. The bed is now defiled. And it's a, it's a spiritual concept. The bed ain't, you could just change the sheets and put the sheet back on and sleep in the bed. But there's something else you understand. There's an energy, there's a frequency with what just happened. And now that frequency has become a part of your bed and you can't enjoy the bed the same way anymore. And so you're gonna throw the bed in the fire. You love that bed. That was your favorite bed of all time. You really loved that bed. That was you sleep in that bed every night and you can't wait to get it. You go outside and you work hard. You're like, man, I can't wait to get home and get in my bed. But when you come home and see strangers laying in your bed and sleeping in your bed, no matter how much that was your favorite bed, and you it, even while you're burning it, it's still your favorite. You're like, you, you have all the memories of, man, I hope I, you know, I hope I can get another bed. You know, this man, that bed was, was so amazing. And you, while you're watching it burn. And it hurts you to burn that bed because you loved it. You know what I'm saying? I know it's an inanimate object, but I'm, I'm hoping you guys can, can walk with me here. But it bothers you to burn that bed because you loved it. But it got to go. Because if the sin of that bed separated it from you, the bed got to go. You can't use it the same anymore. Right? And so that's how we, we put ourselves, when we commit sin, we put ourselves in separation to God. To where now there's a barrier. I can't enjoy you the same way anymore. I can't fellowship you with, you with you the same way anymore. I can't hear your prayers the same way anymore because you've placed a barrier between us. You've defiled yourself with your sin, right? You've defiled yourself with your sin. I can't enjoy you no more. You've put a barrier between us. I can't enjoy that bed anymore. I can't lay in that thing anymore because it's been defiled by sin and wickedness and somebody's evil. And now I'm now and now I want to be eternally separated from the bed, and I want the bed to be burned up, and, and I'm and I'll get a new bed. Well, a lot of our sin eternally separates us from God, right? And 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 the penalty for sin is death and eternal condemnation, right? So the penalty for our sin is to be eternally separated from God and die. You don't want that bed back. It's done. It's already defiled. You have no use for that bed anymore. It's defiled itself. Sin has defiled the bed. You have no use for it anymore. And again, I know this is an inanimate an, 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 an object, right? I know this is an inanimate object, So you, it's, it's, but we're, we're here with the bed. God is high in the heavens, mighty and above us. He's not a human being to relate to us like human beings. Yeah, we got to forgive one another for sin. But this is what the, this is what happens. And we got to forgive our brothers for sin. We're not going to let sin separate us from our brother. That's human just like us. But God is almighty and holy and righteous. He's not like us. Right? So now the, the beauty is that, that God said, you know what? Their sin has separated them from me. Their sin has defiled them. Their sin is detestable. Their sin has made them abominable. The sin has put a wedge between us to where I can't, I don't want to, I can't enjoy them the same way anymore because I'm holy and righteous and I can't enjoy something that has been detested and defiled through sin the way I used to. But you know what? I still love them. While you're burning that bed, you still love it. You like, but you're just watching it, but it got to go. But I still love, so you know what? I'm going to send my son, right? 
to pay a price so that these things can be made clean again, so that I can be reconciled to them again. I don't, he can throw it out, he can burn it, but I'm gonna, pre I'm gonna create a way so that that which has become defiled can be made clean again through my son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm gonna send my son to be perfect, to, to be perfect and undefiled, right? And take all of their sin and kill it on the cross so that through him, all these things that have been defiled and separated from me through their sin can be reconciled onto me again. And that's, that's the love of God. You don't love that much. You're going to throw the better away. You'll divorce your wife and say, I can get a new one. You'll break, a, you'll break God's covenant with your wife that you made and say, I'll, I'll get a new wife. There's plenty of fish in the sea. You don't love that much. You ain't going to sacrifice for your wife. You won't even, sacri you ain't, you ain't even sacrifice peace of mind. You know, you definitely ain't going to sacrifice things that you love, right? You won't even sacrifice the small things. You won't even sacrifice discomfort and dis-ease. Well, I don't want to say dis-ease, but, but you won't even sacrifice discomfort, right? Because you, you don't love that much. Your love ain't that deep. But then we want to say, well, why this and why this, why that? Well, God paid a price for us to be reconciled unto him again. But whoever rejects that, those beds got to be thrown into the fire. There's no use for them. Doesn't mean I don't love them. I don't still don't love my bed, but there's no use for it anymore. It can't be used. It has no. It, it can't be used. It's been defiled. I'm holy, and I mean I know the cameras keep going in and out. I'm sorry about that. Um, well, my apologies for that. Um, so that it can't be used anymore, right? It's been separated from me. So if you reject the way that I paved and made for you, the way that I made for you to be reconciled onto me again, the only thing left for you is fire. Right? If there was a way for your bed to be made clean again, right? Let's just say, and I know I'm, this is an inanimate, an inanimate analogy, but I hope you could, you, your imagination can walk with me. If there was a way that your bed could be made clean again, and your bed had the choice to become clean again, through the way that you made, and you, and you made a big sacrifice for it to happen. And the best said, no, nah, I, don't, I, I, I don't want that. Well, then you got to burn. Then I have to burn you up. I, what, what else can I do with you? I got to burn it up. I got to do something with it. This is, it's in my house, taking up space. I got to do something with it. I got to burn it up. All right? But all those who are willing to accept the sacrifice in the way that was made for them are welcome to come and be reconciled unto me because God loves us so much that he wants to fellowship with us. And, and, and these things separated him from us, but he sent his only son so that we can be reconciled to him again so that we so there is a way we can be made clean again. So that although the rules he set in place, this one, again, I gave the analogy on, on, on Patreon, right? We understand capital punishment in life. If a guy goes right now and murders a whole shopping mall, we under, and, and they give him the death penalty, no one, no one bats an eye, right? Everyone understands. Um, everyone understands that, all right, capital punishment is likely a just consequence for what just happened. We say, all right, he, he, he murdered 10 people in the mall. They, they're going to give him the lethal injection. No one cares. And I don't say no one, but most people don't even think twice about it. They go on and live their lives. So, well, he shouldn't have did that. Well, the wages for sin is death, the Bible says. That's man's law, right? People don't even got to, I've seen people, you know, people don't even got to fully um, kill anybody. I, there's, there's all kinds of stories of people that simply, and I don't want to say simply, but that commit an action of theft. And the owners of the store beat them to death, right? Because they stole from their store and the guy catches them and they beat the guy so bad that he dies. And most people don't bat an eye at that. Yeah, that's it's terrible. To, man, that, that's misfortunate. But most people don't go demand justice from the store owner. Right? Most people don't. They understand, oh, well, he stole. He shouldn't have stole. And, and you know, it, 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 this, it, it, this is the consequence. This is what happens when you steal. Yeah, I, I don't think he should have died. But, you know, I'm not mad at the owner either. That's kind of the attitude of a lot of people. But so why we don't understand God's law? That's man's law. And we respect it. We don't go to the government and say, you shouldn't, you can't kill a serial killer. You have no right to kill him. You're not God. Most people don't do that. You know, maybe when they see the mass shooters, they say, why he didn't shoot him? Right? 
so we understand that that we understand that in, in, in man's law, but why when it comes to God's law, all of a sudden God's law has to be what we want it to be. God says the penalty for sin is death, that the wages for sin is death. That's his law. That's so we, his law is above man's law. So if he said our sin, the he made a world, made us in it, right? And it said the wages for sin in my world, here's the law. The wages for sin is death. That's his law. That's how he made it. We got to respect it. Because that's how he made it. So while we understand government law, human law, man's law, and we respect it, and in, 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 in the country that I'm in, if you get caught with, you, if you, you, you can get the death penalty for having too much marijuana. I think they've laxed on that law, but that's how it was for a while. People in, in America, it, weed is legal, but you can get the death penalty for drugs here, even on the airplane. On the airplane here, when you get on the airplane and you land, it says to you, what they say is, um, they said, attention to the, this is the automated voice. It's not a real person speaking. It's an automated voice. It's attention. You are not allowed to have illegal substances or narcotics in our country. If found, the offender can suffer a maximum penalty of death. That's the automated voice when you land on the plane. And when they say, oh, if found, the offender can suffer a maximum penalty of death. No one bats an eye. People don't turn their heads and look at each other and say, oh, my, can, I can't believe they're killing people for having drugs. Because they respect the laws of man. They say, well, this is a different country. They have different rules. They're different. They have a different system here. No one bats an eye. Say, so how are you going to kill people for having drugs? You know what I'm saying? They say, how are you going to kill somebody for having drugs? Nobody really bats an eye at it. Everybody gets off the plane, takes their bags, and, and goes on about their business and, and doesn't have any drugs. And they respect man's law. Now, in America, if, if they said that in America, people are like, no, whoa, you know, because the way that we've accepted sin, right? But what, you know, that if you, but if they didn't admit people were bad, now it's a different consciousness, but they, they respect the man's law here. They respect the law of that land. So the ultimate law of this land is the law of God. And the law of God says the wages of sin is death. And that's the system that he set in place. And that's what we have to adhere to and respect. But he loved us so much that he created a way for us to be reconciled unto him again, which brings me to number three. The third reason God hates sin is because it separates it separates us from him. And, 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 and God loved us so much that he gave his son for us so that we can be reconciled to him again and have a relationship with him. He didn't, he, he can, he, he didn't say, oh, they sinned and, and they separated from you. Oh, that's it. No, he made a way. He so God's the Bible says God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, and whomever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So that through my son, I'll sacrifice my own son so that all these people that have been defiled and wicked, filled with iniquity and evil, can be cleansed of their sin and reconciled unto me again through him. Because I don't want to be separate from them. I love them. I love my, my creation. I don't want to be separate from them. Now there's a law in place, but God has made a way. Right. He's made a way that through Jesus Christ. That the consequences for our sins could be paid off. And I give the analogy if, if Joe Biden right now canceled all student loan debt. You know, and. It, you know, so most people will keep paying if he didn't announce it publicly, most people would keep paying their debt. Some of the, the debt offices would close up because they know the law was passed, but some of the evil debt offices, they would stay open because they know that they can still keep collecting money and that the people paying them haven't heard it yet, haven't heard yet that um, the, the, the student loan debt has been canceled. And um, some, of them are, some of the people will try to go back and, and say, hey, wait, you, you, I, you can't keep charging me for these, for, these, for these infractions. And they say, well, no, you kept paying, so that's, that's your fault, not mine. You should have you knew what was available to you. You should have knew that it was paid off. And so we have to know that our sin has been paid, but we have to receive that gift through Jesus Christ, right? We have to, in our hearts, it's a matter of the heart. You have to have an open heart. If you call on the name of Jesus Christ without an open heart, ain't much going to happen. You have to have an open heart. Your heart has to be pure. The heart is going to give the charge, you know? I used to talk about the heart before, but the heart's going to so say, when you call on the name of Jesus Christ with an open heart, and you ask for forgiveness of your sins, to be cleaned and washed of your sins, your sins become renewed. You become a new creation and you can be reconciled onto the Father again. You can receive his spirit of adoption, be one of his children and have your prayers heard, right? And have your prayers heard. 
for Jesus paid the way for us to speak, to commune, to fellowship, to be in, in relationship with God again, despite the separation that happened due to our sin, because we were defiled and, and, and of no use anymore. But through Jesus Christ and faith and belief on him and there's in the blood that he shed and taking our sins into his body on the cross and paying a price so that all of our debts can be paid, that we can once again be reconciled back to the Father again. Right? You can't owe, you can't owe, um, you can't live in your house and owe and be backed up 10 months on rent and still stay there. You being backed up with debt is gonna separate you from that house. You could love your house and be and be 10 months behind on payments. They're gonna say, hey, well, listen, I know you love this house. But you owe too much money on this house. We have to evict you. So your, your, your debt is going to separate you from this house. Now, if you can pay the debt, you can keep living in this house. But if you can't pay this debt, the debt of your sin, because every sin that you commit is debt. Let's just say every sin you commit is, a, is a, let's just say hypothetically, is a thousand dollars debt, five thousand dollars debt. And you don't got no spiritual money. Right. Every sin you pay is debt. And, and so if you don't pay for this house, you all right, all your sins, you've, you've racked up $25,000 in sin on this apartment, on this house. And if you, if you can pay it, you can stay here. But if you can't pay it, we're going to have to evict you out of this home. Yeah, but I love this home. But yeah, I know you love it. And it's a nice home. And I don't want your house. But there's a law in place. And the law says that if you don't pay your debt, we have to take the house from you. Well, we have a debt of sin. And if it doesn't get paid, that sin will separate us from our house. It'll separate us, that sin will separate us from God. But the debt has been paid. Now you might say, so you might lose your house and say, man, I lost my house. I didn't know, man, I, I didn't have the money to pay it. And somebody said, yo, you didn't know that there's a there's a, a office on 31st Street that, that's giving out loans? What is giving out free money? And then no, I didn't know. I mean, everybody that goes to that office, they give them free money and they pay their home off for good. Right? And then they, they say, they, then they go to the office and say, hey, you guys give out free money. I said, yeah, I, you know, some 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 quadrillionaire just gave money for anybody that has debt to be paid off, and then they can keep their homes. You need some money? Yeah, I need some here. Here's 25000 Go pay your house off and go live there and enjoy. Um, you know, and that's an analogy, but there's just some nuance there, but I'm just giving you guys an analogy. So um, our debt separated us from God. That debt separated us from our home, right? From being able to be in the kingdom of, to be, to be in the kingdom of God. That sin separated us from us being able to be home. But through Jesus Christ, that debt is paid. And when we go to the Lord Jesus Christ, we can receive payment for the debt of our sin and we can come back home. The debt in Christ will rise in Christ. We can go back home. Our sins can be watched. We can be reconciled onto the Father again, the creator of all things. And again, and I'll, I'll, I'll read again. And then I'm going to start reading the comments, guys, after I just read the scripture again. Isaiah 59, it says, Sure, the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ears too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. <clears throat> God can save you. He can hear you too. But your sin has separated you from him and hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. So when you pray and he's not hearing, it's not that he can't hear. He Surely he can hear. Surely his arm is big enough to save you. But your sin has separated from you so that he doesn't hear you, right? Because your sin has separated him from you. You need to pay that off. That sin needs to be paid off so that you can be heard again. It needs to be paid so you can be heard Right, Proverbs 28, 9 says, He turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination to God. He that turneth his ear away from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. Right? Because you've racked up too much debt and now you have to be thrown, you're evicted from your house. However, a debt has been paid by the Lord Jesus Christ that came in the flesh and gave his life on the tree for the sins of the world that all who believe unto him shall be saved, was buried in the tomb for three days and resurrected from the dead, walked the earth again for 40 days in the flesh, and then was taken back up to sit down at the right hand of the Father where he waits his enemies to be made a footstool unto his feet. But you have to receive the payment for your debt so that your prayers can be heard, so that you can be reconciled unto God, so that you can become God's child and he can become your father. 
I'm going to do the next live stream. What I'm going to do is going to be called, are you a child of God or a child of the devil? Because they are children of God. The Bible says, and they are children of the devil. You only become a, you're not, you're not a child of God by birth. Your mom and your dad can't go fornicate and make a baby. And this child is somehow a child of God because they decided to fornicate and make a baby. You become a child of God when you receive the spirit of adoption by where we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit of adoption is the Holy Spirit. When you receive the spirit of God, you become reconciled unto God through his, by his spirit, through his son, who, who's the baptizer and giver of the Holy Spirit. You become reconciled unto God, all right? And then you become a child of God. But if you have not received that, you are not a child of God because you have not been adopted in and grafted in to the family of God. It is through his spirit that you are adopted, but you receive that spirit when your sins are washed through your faith and belief in Jesus Christ who paid your debt on the cross so that you can, you can receive that spirit, so that you can receive the Holy Spirit, right, from a holy God through his son who took all of our sins so that we can be made righteous through Jesus Christ, not through our own efforts and works. And then through him, we can receive the Holy Spirit and become children of God. But you're not a child of God by birth. You're a child of God by adoption. Because our sin, the sin of your mother and your father and our mothers and fathers that had us, that we inherited, has separate. How, 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 am I be a, how can you be a father and a mother that is separate from God and make a child that's connected to God? You're going to be your mom and a dad, right? You're, you're separated from God. You guys are wicked and do all kinds of sin, separated from God. You're completely blocked from God. But somehow you come together and fornicate, which is a new sin, and make a child of God, Right? And whether you're married or not, if you want to send you, I'm just saying it just it just adds to the it is more fuel to the fire. How how does that how does that work? People say, why do these things happen to babies? Why why babies are innocent? No, we're not innocent. You know what I mean? The, like I said, we're born in sin. The Bible says, and and um, that which produced this child and brought it here. That which committed this sin to this child, first of all, they, once again, they're using God's instruments to do evil. I told you, your body is God's. He made it. Your hands are God's. Your imagination is God's. He made it. He And he drew the limitations on your imagination, which is why the Bible says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor has, no, no has any heart imagined what God has planned for those who love him. Because there's a limitation on our imagination. It's broad. It's vast. But there's a limit on it by which we can't imagine what God has planned for those who love him. So he even drew the limitations around your imagination. That's his imagination. Whatever you're using to imagine, to fantasize, to think, to create, to build, to do, he facilitated it all. The metal on your, is his, the yeah, iPhone you got is his. He made the glass and the metal in the, in the, in the, in the, in the it's his. Now you may have used his creation and reshaped what he made, but it's still his. You just put your brain on it, but it's his. But how can you put your, you know, your evil brand on something that's God made good. How can you take something God made for good and turn it evil and expect it not to be some kind of judgment for that? Right? It is evil, right? Um, Dr. Hood, Dr. Hood, Dr. Doom, email me, brother. We can we can pray, we can talk, man. If you want to talk, email me, eddiefuse at gmail.com. We can we can talk, man. We can definitely talk. I'm going to read some of the comments, guys, and I'm going to wrap it up. But <clears throat> that's the point, man. I, I, and anybody that didn't watch it through, I encourage you to watch the whole thing through. Because this is a sermon I have today. It's the three reasons God hates sin. Um, and I, I'm, I, I, can give a, I don't want to give a little rundown. <laughs> and um, anybody that doesn't have my three-hour class, I have a new three-hour class called the Proverbs 31 Woman. Uh, email me, eddiefuse.gmail.com to get it. It does cost. Um, but there are also a few classes on my website. As well, eddiefuse.com slash shop. And the only class that's not on my website is class four, which you can email me for as well. It's called The Reason You Are Alive. It's going to talk about the reason you're alive, the purpose by which you're alive. It's a three hour, it's like three hours and seven minutes long. It comes with a downloadable PDF of the slideshow presentation that you can also have to read and to review as well. You can get that off my site, eddiefuse.gmail.com. Anyone, anyone that wants to send a donation, uh, my PayPal is in the description box. Everything helps, guys. Um, and my Venmo is in the description box as well. If anybody wants to donate, if you can't, because I know for a while I couldn't donate on YouTube either. So if anybody that doesn't have the option to send a YouTube donation that, that wants to, if you don't want to keep it, um, it's fine. Um, but anybody that wants to, I have a, a Venmo and a PayPal in my description box. But again, let me just run through it again. I'm gonna read some of these comments and we're gonna go. Uh, the world is, 
the three reasons God hates sin is because everything is his. He made everything. We just take what he, he's made and reshape it to make iPhones and houses and, and clothes. But he made it all. So when you, you take what's God's and you join it to evil, how can you take what's mine's and join it to evil, right? The second reason God hates sin is because it, it defiles us. It makes us not able to fellowship with him anymore because God is holy. Like I said, if, if you had a, a bed and you have a child and your child or you come home one day and there's two strangers sleeping in your bed. And for some people, if, if it was like, let's just say it was two men sleeping together in your bed, you would want to throw the bed away because the bed is now defiled. You can't sleep in it anymore because you can't, it, what, the, the, what was committed in that bed has defiled it. And now you're separate from that bed and you probably want to burn the bed up now or at least throw it away and destroy it and get a new bed, right? But God didn't throw us away and destroy us. He, did, he flooded the earth once and saved the righteous, um, but he, he, he provided a way for us that through his son, that our defilement can be removed, that the price for our sin can be paid and that we can be reconciled unto him again, right? Through his son, Jesus Christ. And, right, like I said, if you live in a house right now and you owe debt on that house, if you don't pay the debt, they take the house away and kick you out. The, yes, your debt will separate you from the house, right? Well, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. So the only price that can be paid for our sin is death, which is why in the Old Testament, they had to make a sacrifice because it, 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 death needed to happen for, the, for, for to, to that the dead animal pays the price for the sin, right? Because the only thing, the, the wages of sin is death. So it means unless you pay death for your sin, that's the, that's the only, but then, when, then you're done, right? That's the only payment that can be made. However, he sent his son to die, to be pure, holy, and clean, and give his life for us, taking all of our sin and killing it on the cross so that our debts can be paid, so that we can be connected to that him again, so that, our house, so that we don't get evicted from our house, so that we don't get separated from our house because we can't pay the debt. Um, and the last reason is because our sin separates us from God, and he loves us, man. That's why he sent his son for us, for he so loved the world, and he loves his creation and what he made. And he, doesn't want, he doesn't want us to perish. He doesn't want us to be destroyed. Um, but if we, don't, if we don't accept that sacrifice, we're going to perish because that's the way that he created, he made. And his son that he loved, he made a way for us to be reconciled onto him through his son, Jesus Christ. And if we don't accept the payment for our debt and believe onto Jesus Christ and pick up our cross and follow after him, it's more than just believing. It's believing, but then you, it's also picking up your cross and following after him um, as, a, as a sign of gratitude and appreciation for the debt that was paid then there's a price to pay for that. And that price is throwing the bed in the fire because it has no use anymore. It's been defiled, you know? Um, so that's, that's what we got. I'm gonna read a couple of the comments and um, I'll read a couple of comments, guys. And I'm, I'm, I'm gonna wrap it up. Shout out to John, global photographer, King Ken, Joe Blast. What's up, Joe Blast? I see you heard my song, man. Um, Gambino, see Proverbs 33 through 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding and all your ways. Submit to him and he will make your path straight. Sure, yes, sir. Shout out to the Milwaukee. You speak for all the Latinos in Milwaukee, Gambino. I, I hear you. <laughs> brother, please acknowledge your community for we are a reason. All right, good, brother. Um... I'm preaching a sermon, brother. Are you, it's all, God bless you, man. God bless you. I read on the news that, that the chance of winning the Mega Millions is 1 in 335 million. But the key to repent, get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and pursue his Holy Spirit. Okay. GA, email me, man. If you want to talk, I said I'm willing to talk. Anybody that wants to talk and, 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 and discuss these things in further detail or, 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 or just understanding or even dialogue, talk about your life and and receive any direction or advice or whatever, I'm willing to talk. Email me, adfusergmail.com. Adfuser, just email me your name and your story. Give me a little background on you and just put your phone number in there. Make sure you include your phone number in the email so I can call you when, I'm, when I have time. Um, and if anybody wants deliverance, I've been doing deliverance this week. Uh, I did a few deliverances this week. Um, I've been doing more deliverances than I've done. Well, probably the most I've done in one week was this week. Um, but I mean, anybody wants deliverance from unclean spirits, um, email me at gmail.com. Leave your number in the email so I can call you. Not everybody checks the email. So if you got your number, I'll be able to call you when I have time. And Dr. Doom, if you want to email me as well, email me at gmail.com. We can talk about that. Johnny Del Rome, what's up, brother? Good to see you. Proverbs 31 is great. 
right? The power of story one woman is the class available now. All right, guys, man, that's that is the class. That is the live stream for today. Peace, 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 and love, guys. If anybody has any other questions or comments or whatever, whichever it may be, email me at eddiefuse at gmail.com and I will and leave your phone number in every email in case I don't respond, but I will make a point to call you at some time. So if, I, if, you, if you don't get an email response, I, you'll get a call at some point. You will get a call from me. Um, but peace, guys. Peace, peace. And so, John 8, man, good to see you, man. I want—I got something to tell you, too, because uh, I want to tell you something, man. Um, but I, I'll, I'll save that, you know. But anyway, guys, peace and love, guys, and, and everybody be well, man. God bless, man. All glory, honor, and praise to the Father in heaven through my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Glory to our Father who, who sits above the heavens, for earth is his footstool and heaven is his throne. And our Lord Jesus Christ at his right hand who gave his life on the cross for the sins of the world, that our debts can be paid and all who believe unto him shall not perish but be saved and have eternal life. Peace and love, God.